Hello, I'm Jennifer Marquis. I'm a certified diabetes educator that works with Barnes Care, which is the corporate health services and occupational med division of, Barnes, of BJC. So I'm here today to talk to you about a topic that is very important and close to my heart, diabetes education. The thing about diabetes education is a lot of us think we already know. We think it may not apply to us. We think that maybe it's someone else's issue or someone else's concern. This is where I want you to think about it today. I want you to think about where you are and the choices that you make and how they can affect you in the future. Most of you may have heard something about diabetes, whether it be on social media, on um, a visit to your doctor's office, on something that has brought you to this website today or to this class to let you say, hey, I need to learn a little bit more about this topic. My goal today is to give you two pieces, at least, information that number one is new to you, but also that may change how you approach diabetes or diabetes education in the future. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at changing our perspective, looking at the background, looking at where we come from and where we are going. The truth of the matter is diabetes is everywhere. There are 29.1 million people in the United States that have diabetes. 21 million of these individuals or one out of every 11 already know that they have the disease. They have the condition. They're being followed or seen by a healthcare provider or they're aware of some of the, the concerns of this condition. The scary fact is one out of every four Americans has the disease but is not aware. They are undiagnosed. So that's a lot of people. It's a lot of people that are struggling with a health condition and it hasn't even been identified for them yet. So what we wanna look at too is there's a population ahead of the curve. There's a population that we now refer to as prediabetes. So what increases the risk of getting diabetes? If you're in that population of the one in three people in the United States that has diabetes or has prediabetes, we need to pay attention to what ups that ante, what makes it more dramatic for us when we have these things in the background. We, we look at age, we look at the factors of where we are and who we are as a person. We look at our family history. We look at diseases or conditions that ha have affected our pancreas. We also look at the backgrounds, the ethnic groups, the racial um, specifications that we have. We can't change any of this. This is not a necessity, but we need to know. We need to know what our family history was. We need to know the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, whoever has been dealing with this condition because it raises our risk factors to get it in our own lives. We also look at our history for women who have had gestational diabetes, which is the diabetes that comes when a person is pregnant. It's a hormone imbalance and, and they tend to have greater than nine pound babies and we tend to have higher risk factors when we develop gestational. So if we have any of these things on our checklist from who we are, we wanna pay a little bit closer attention to diabetes and prediabetes. It also matters how we live. If we have conditions that affect our health, our high blood pressure, if you have low HDL cholesterol or high triglycerides, those things also raise the risk factor of getting diabetes. We wanna pay attention to our weight. Is it a healthy weight? Are we overweight? Are we classified as obese? And some of these are hard questions to ask when we go to a doctor. Where do I fall on that risk factor list? Where do I need to be? We also need to pay attention to some of the choices we make, not only the healthy eating, but our lifestyle and our activity levels. How much exercise do you really get during a week? So what do the numbers tell us? There are blood tests that, that tell us whether we have diabetes, whether we have prediabetes. This is a, uh, an example of kind of the spectrum. We have normal numbers that say anything below 5.6 on a hemoglobin A1C blood test will tell us that the body's functioning normally. It's doing what it's supposed to to control that glucose level. It's managing, it's processing, you're getting the fuel and the energy. If you have some symptoms of diabetes that, and you get a blood test done and it's normal, part of us just take a deep breath and we say, okay, we're good, right? But there may be some other causes. There may be a reason that you feel fatigued or tired or weak, and we might need to address that with a physician or another healthcare provider. If you have prediabetes, you fall in this middle area, which is 5.7 to 6.4. The importance of this number is a lot of times you're given a number and if you don't ask what it means or aren't told what it means, 
you don't know that that affects your risk factor. If you don't know that the test was run on you or you don't know when to ask for it, it's really a challenge to be able to make changes in our lifestyle and to make behavior changes last. With diabetes, we classify that as any A1C that is 6.5 or above. In that case, what we try to do once there is diagnosed diabetes is get as close as possible to that 6.5 as we can. And if we can get tight control and copy what the rest of the, of the body should be doing and maintain that long term, we'll eliminate the risk factors and, and, and the problems with complications with diabetes in the long term. One thing that I want to point out, this is the good news, is that if we make two changes, if we have prediabetes, we're in that middle zone where we're talking about 5.7 to 6.4, and we make two tangible conscious efforts, one is on the weight loss. If I am considered overweight or, or obese, if I can lose 7% of my total body weight, and number two, if I'm not exercising, that I can increase to a moderate level of exercise, 30 minutes, five days a week, which ends up being 150 minutes out of my week. If I can do those two, respect, those two changes, it reduces my risk of progressing to diabetes by 58%. It's dramatic, it's humongous to be able to make that much of a difference based on a lifestyle change. A lot of times we think food and exercise, it's an extra, it's an added, it's a bonus. It's something that I do when I have time or when it's convenient. Well, we need to actually push that to the forefront and we need to make those choices consciously. The bad news is if we don't make changes right now, if we say, I know that I'm at risk, but I really can't work this in, 15 to 30% of the people with prediabetes will end up with a diagnosis of diabetes within five years. So that's our proof. Our proof is, is it's worth it to make those changes to move forward. For those individuals that already have diabetes, the news is still very good as well. We look at the fact that if we can reduce the A1C by one percentage point, if we can drop that, we lower the risk of eye disease, kidney disease, nerve damage by close to 40%. That's also an amazing drop. So for making those extra efforts and those extra choices that fine tune our control and manage, and it just may be that we make that appointment a little bit more frequently. We test the blood sugar just a little bit more to be able to have that final result that we want. So we work towards that and we push forward to be able to say, okay, I did the best that I can to keep the body on track and copy what my body should have been doing in the first place. It needed my help to do so. Benefits of diabetes, education, are, are, go right along with these reductions. We end up taking less medications, we end up reducing risk factors, we have a greater understanding and empowerment of the disease itself. There's two things that you can never have enough of, one of which is education. The other is the drive and the willingness to make a change if you see that possibility. It's very, very important to be able to look at your situation and make choices. So what we do with this is we look at it and we say, hey, I can't do X, Y, Z, but I'm going to do this instead, right? It's all about the results and the changes that we want to make. So I ask my, my friends, my family, my colleagues, almost everybody that I interact with, we have a choice. Ask yourself the tough question, what changes am I willing to make to get the results I want. It's not about making changes that someone else told you you had to do. It's a determining your course and your journey and finding the way to get there with the least resistant, making the journey part of the process. Thank you for your time. I appreciate all of the, all of the input and the, the effort. And if I can be of any help, please don't hesitate to ask.